Hello and welcome to a special edition of Growth Masterminds. I'm on the road. I'm in Lisbon at Web Summit. But last week, I did a very special session with the CEO of Singular, Gadi Eliashev, a LinkedIn Live on Scan4, which of course is brand new from Apple. It's out there. It's live. We have the documentation right now. We think we know what most of it even means. And we're sharing that in an hour's time. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. This is going to be a great hour. We're going to chat about a lot of stuff, obviously, all around SK at that work number four, version four. We already have one question. It's from Eric. And will this be recorded? Yes, it's actually going to be available, I guess, forever on LinkedIn, um, just in the flow of I guess, events and streams and posts from Singular. It will also be part of the Singular podcast and it'll go on Singular's YouTube. So there'll be multiple places to get it. And guess what? There's more questions coming up. We will definitely explain that and we will go into some detail. We have some slides. We have a lot of stuff. If you have questions, just add them to the comments. They show up. We can share them here. We can see them and then we will talk about them. Okay, so... I'm going to start, I think, with a bit of hmm, a bit of an intro as to where we are, what's going on, what we're going to talk about today, and what's happening in the world of iOS and mobile marketing. Obviously, we're talking Scan4. There's some good. There's some bad. There's some ugly. We're going to talk about all that. In terms of the good, we got more postbacks. Hey, that's great. There's more potential data in the first postback, right? If you have low numbers, you'll get coarse conversion data in the in those first postbacks. But if you have more, you'll get fine. That's great. There's the source identifier. So there's more information. There's web to app. That's cool. There's more clarity around crowd anonymity, what that looks like, how it works. And you can even get early postbacks via locking. There's some that maybe isn't so great the super long up to six day timers for postbacks two and three and there's some ugly that's largely in the ecosystem right it's going to take some time the ecosystem needs to adapt everyone's dealing with multiple versions of scan most of us haven't even figured out version three right version four is literally more complicated we're going to talk about that we're going to talk about the details how crowd on crowd anonymity works, how the tiers work, all that stuff. And we'll ask Gotti to share some details on singular product changes to support scan four. Okay, so let's get this up here. This is singular, by the way, who is sponsoring the session. Thank you so much. That is great. Let's talk about the whole point of scan, right? The whole point of scan is privacy. This is how Apple looks at it with crowd anonymity. In terms of measurement, the more volume you've got, the more places people have to hide, essentially, right? The more data you're going to get. Gotti, your thoughts? Yeah, I think the nice thing is that the, there's finally some clarity on how uh, crowd anonymity is going to work. Or they used to call it privacy thresholds, and it's kind of vague. Um, and now it's pretty obvious it's going to be installs and also the documentation clarified when that's being determined and that at the, at the time to install. So we'll, we'll show some examples of how that works, but, you know, at least kind of provide some clarity in that it's mostly dependent on how many people come from a particular source or channel, stuff like that. Exactly. So we put this together and this is kind of, if you want to think of it, scan in scan four in one chart, right? You've got three potential postbacks. You've got four tiers. Um, you've got a variety of conversion windows and you have a variety of random postback delays. It is a bit of a pilot's dashboard eye chart, Gotti. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> it's quite an eye chart. Um, Basically, um, the nice thing is you get three postbacks, not always, but that's what the framework can offer for you. And they introduced this concept of the tiers, right? The, the postback tiers or the crowd anonymity tiers. And depending on the tier you're in, you're going to get different data points. So in the lowest tier, which is tier zero, you're just going to get uh, the two-digit source identifier, which is what we used to know as campaign ID in, in previous scan iteration, um, and you're not going to get any further postbacks. If you get to tier one, which probably means you have more installs, you're going to get two digits. 
and you're going to get a conversion value, but that's coarse. It means that you only have low, medium, or high. So you need to figure out how you encode stuff in that. Uh, when you get more installs, you get to tier two, and your conversion value is going to start getting better. And then when you get even more installed than that, then in tier three, you'll even know the source app or the publisher app or website because now uh, SK Network actually supports um, uh, web ads only in Safari though, but that's uh, but that's nice. Um, and, and, and in all these tier one to tier three, you're basically going to get the second and third post back. They're always going to have course conversion value, but uh, definitely an improvement. There's a lot of rules and caveats and we're going to try and unpack them, but uh, definitely an improvement. There are a ton of caveats there and there are some, there's some challenging things to understand, honestly, in terms of what you get in tier two and tier three and whether you get two or three or four digits of source identifier, it's not easy. We're going to get into all those details and going to have, uh, yeah, some good chats and some questions about that as well. Before we jump into that, give us a refresher on this source identifier that takes over the campaign identifier that we had in the past. Yeah, absolutely. So. Apple introduced this concept of, um, I think they call it hier hierarchical IDs, or basically you have a hierarchy where in the lowest level, you just have two digits. And that's what you used to have in previous scan versions. But then as you get more data, you can get more digits up to four digits. And this is an example where they say, you know, you can use the two digits to the campaign, the three digits for location, the four digits for placement, but in their video, they say you can use it for whatever you want. It doesn't even have to be that way. And the idea is that if you have a lower postback tier or you have less installs, you're only going to get the two digit uh, information. Whereas if you have more installs, eventually you're going to get the four digits or the three digits. So whatever you deem most critical, you might want to encode in the, in the two digits and then uh, you know, whatever is more granular, if you have enough volume, you want to encode uh, further into the other uh, three and four digits. Obviously, one of the challenges with crowd anonymity, you got these four tiers. How do you maximize the data? You need to balance, right? Because you need granularity also, right, Gotti? Yeah, absolutely. You're right. It is a balance. And I actually wanted to explain um, a bit about what we said here. So, you know, you might assume that if you got the highest tier, you're going to get the four digit source identifier, right? That makes sense. You're the highest tier. You've earned it. You should get most data, but apparently it doesn't work that way. And we're going to try and build it up as an example. So maybe in the next few slides, we could kind of explain well, you know, I was trying to put it as a visual. Hopefully it's going to be clear. So John, maybe move on to the next one. Sure. Absolutely. Why don't you jump through it? Yeah, so basically, um, this is sort of a hypothetical um, flow of what happens. So uh, one thing we've learned is that Apple needs to store all this information on their servers so they can compute these post-back tiers or this crowd anonymity level. So this is a fictional example where imagine, you know, an Apple server, there's been five installs, and these are the source IDs of these installs. And just a reminder, we're talking about last click attribution. That's what SKI Network does. Um, and basically, yeah, we're actually explaining that <laughs> right now. Um, so now let's take a scenario where there is a new install. And that's the next slide. Um, the ID is 5521. That's the four digit ID. That gets written in Apple server. But then according to the documentation, and there was like, literally there was one paragraph and John, you and I were stared at it for like an hour and like, what do they mean? So we're trying to explain how we think it works. Um, so if you go to the next slide, you see what happens. Basically, Apple will take this new install. It will break it down into a two-digit number, three-digit, and four-digit number. So far, it's pretty easy, right? So 5521 turns into 21, 521, and then 5,521. And then it will count the number of installs for each. And if you, if you see that Apple's server on the left, you can kind of figure out that for 21, we have six installs. All of these installs, their two, their two digits are 21. So we're going to count them. There's going to be six. Then when you look at three digits and you're searching for how many installs have 521, basically ending in 521, there's only one of them. So that uh, number of installs is going to be one. 
And then for the same for the four digits. This is the first install we've had that that had five five two one. So this is the first step. And then what they do is then then they assign a postback tier to each of these hierarchies. So that's what the next slide shows. So it will assign a postback tier. Now we don't know how they assign postback tiers. They have some numbers in the back end that they don't share of how many installs you need to be in tier three. And I think it's part of their plan is like, they don't necessarily want to share that. They might want to change it over time. It was the same thing with uh, privacy thresholds in the past mm -hmm. where it wasn't fairly really clear. But what happens is I, I just put some fictional rules. I don't know if you guys can see it, but I said, you know, if you have more than four installs, you're going to be in tier three, which is the highest tier. Uh, and if you only have one install, you're going to be in tier zero. And these are made up rules, of course. The numbers, I assume, are larger. Uh, but what happens is for each of these uh, different hierarchies, they will assign a postback tier, right? And this is, again, done on a single install. They just look at all the historical data. They see how much data has been accumulated so far, how many installs we got, and then what is the postback tier? And then according to the documentation, they will choose the ID for the postback that has the highest postback tier. So in this example, even though you know, you'll be in tier three because that's the highest postback tier, you're only going to get two digits. You're not going to get four digits. And if you're trying to figure out, okay, well, how many more installs I need until I start getting three digits and four digits, in, in my fake numbers, it will be three more installs. But basically, you get the point. The idea is that it will select the a hierarchy with the highest postback tier. And if you think about it, it's always going to be the two digits first until you have enough installs in three digits, and then you'll go there. And until you have enough installs in that four-digit combination, and then that will become postback tier number three. And then you'll finally get three and four digits in your postbacks. This took me forever to grasp, and that's probably because I'm dumb. I don't know, but it took me forever to grasp. And I, I initially thought of it like uh, kind of a waterfall, and you've got a bucket here, and you've got a bucket here, and you've got a bucket here, and water flows through the tiers until tier one fills up, and then on tier 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 two fills up, and then et cetera, et cetera. That's not the way it works. Everything is in every tier all at the same time. Your number, your source ID has four digits. It can be in those three different tiers. I, at the same time, but how many instances of each are in each tier and that's how it makes sense and that's how it works. So there's lots of questions and I'm just bringing this back again, right? Because of course, everybody wants to maximize the data. So, you know, what's the right number of source IDs to have? Do you, do you try and have a hundred installs per, do you try and have 25, whatever? We're going to figure that out as we go. Obviously, you want to have some level of high volume, so you get a lot of data most of the time, but you need to balance that by getting as much granularity as possible, right? The, one of the challenges is that the ad network determines your source ID, so you need to work with them, be chatting with them, talking them, figuring that out. The other interesting, that, interesting thing that came to my mind when I was thinking about this and looking at this, if you totally didn't care about source IDs, if you totally didn't care about aggregating volume in them or anything like that, you'd be essentially living in a scan three world while scan four is out, right? Scan three gets one post back, two digit source identifier. It's in tier zero, right? So that's pretty much what you'd have. So I think that's probably one of the best ways I can think of to understand these tiers and the source ID and how this all works is, hey, you've got all these installs. There you go. Apple's calculated the number of installs for each of those tiers. And each, each source ID is in multiple tiers any given time. And whichever one has the largest, you're gonna get. So that makes a ton of sense, but it doesn't end there, Gotti. Uh, there oh, yeah. One new... thing, John, I'll add, sorry about the previous slide, is um, we, or maybe the one before, yep. this one makes it seem like the only thing that matters is number of installs per ID, but Good in reality, point. they'll also look at um, the source app that the user came from, and that's another factor. It's just, this is too vague. We don't really know how it will work, but there will probably be more qualifiers, right? So it might not be total number of installs for that ID. It might be total number of installs from that particular source app because 
All they're trying to do is ensure that there is enough crowd anonymity. They're saying if there's enough people installing from, you know, the source app, let's say your source app is Facebook. If there's enough people installing from Facebook to your app and there's enough people with this four digit ID, then we're safe that you're not going to figure out who it is. You don't know if it's Gotti or John or someone else. So we're going to start giving you more data. But if it's a total random app and it's only one time, then you might be able to pinpoint the person. So they're always thinking about uh, how can we protect the identity of, of the individual. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So that's not the only thing to think about in terms of scan for. There's also these new postback periods and also locking the conversion value early. Walk us through, I guess, those periods and also, Gaudi, a little bit about locking the value early, why you do that, how that might work, um, and why that might be important. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, at first, when SK Network 4 was announced, there's quite the discussion, and maybe even, even go to the previous slide, where um, it wasn't fully clear when um, the, the window ends for each post back and eventually we figured out okay well it's going to be at the end of two days at the end of seven days and the end of 35 days and those are set and there was something nice about it because it kind of gave some determinism to the, mecha to the mechanism like we're like okay you got three windows and you always know when it's going to end and there was even some relief in the industry i don't know if it warranted it or not but it was a relief that that said this will force everybody to do the same thing and you can't have some ad networks asking their customers to send the post back immediately and not wait for two days. It will basically level the playing field and it will give advertisers enough time to collect data, et cetera. Uh, but then when they released scan four, uh, basically uh, they enabled you to enjoy both roles. You both have these predetermined windows during which you can update the conversion value. And you know that after, the first period, which is two days, the value is going to finalize. And after seven days, another value is going to finalize. So now they introduce this locking mechanism, which is kind of showing in the diagram in the next slide, where you can decide, you know what? I don't want to wait to the end of the seventh day to send that value. I'm pretty sure this is a great value. I want to send it sooner. So, you know, in the face of it, it looks like a nice feature. The downsides are that it just adds more complexity. Like if you got, let's say you wanted to measure, you know, seven day revenue and you already got that revenue. Well, maybe you wouldn't do it for revenue, but if you wanted to measure an event and you could send it after four days instead of seven, there's no way to tell that you decided to lock the window. That information is not going to come back in the post back. So there's some complexity. Maybe it's not that bad, but it's some complexity. Uh, the other bummer is that now, again, big networks will force advertisers to do the to do things that they prefer. And they'll say, you know what? Don't wait for two days. Always lock the window after one day. That's what we demand if you want to work with us. <laughs> and that's likely to happen. So, you know, that's some of the downsides uh, for this. And, you know, I guess the, the other thing that was sort of a big discovery was, was, I guess, the timers, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It is interesting, right? Um, the super long timers, uh, the multiple tiers, it's going to take some time for the ecosystem to adopt this, right? It's going to take some time to adapt it. I mean, we talked about earlier, we barely started working with scan three. Now we've got scan four. What all has to change so that everybody's ready and this is up and running? Yeah, we were trying to simulate what, what, you know, what do you need to do from each side of the equation, right? So if you think about it, let's say you're an end network, right? So, First, you kind of have to rebuild your systems to deal with all this information. For example, the ad network decides the source ID. And we just showed an example, right, John? You talked about it. Like, if you go too crazy with your source IDs, you end up not having enough installs and you're always going to get two digits. So the ad networks will need to decide how they translate their campaign structure into the four digits. Yeah. And when do they use two digits or four digits? Well, they always use it, but they might want to use the same to, to accumulate the, the data faster. So that's one thing they need to build into their engines. Um, and maybe, you know, some networks will make it available for the advertisers to select, but I'm sure that, you know, the folks, the SANS basically will probably be um, uh, taking control over that. 
the other thing is that um uh, you know, I was I was wondering, and I kind of you know we had a discussion internally, but it seems like it can't just be uh, a server side update. And I'm actually checking to see if my team agrees with me. Uh, yep. So it seems like it's not going to be just a server side update. If you're, let's say, you're uh, Iron Source or Vungle or like any other network, and you have people using your SDK, it's a mediation SDK. Um, you'll need to update the code in the client where you show ads to people, that code needs to change a bit to sign mm -hmm. the signature for SK Network 4. So that also takes some time. It's not a pure server-side update. So, so ad networks need to change their algorithms and AI internally. They need to change their SDK and deploy that. And now with all this conversion value craziness, <laughs> they also need to adapt for that, right? Because you have, for the second and third post back, you have much longer timers, right? So even though we can somehow send a seven day revenue, can you imagine it might come in the day, like almost in the 14 day <laughs> when it's gonna arrive? Almost then, like, 13 yeah, days so, later. <laughs> yeah, a one, a one week cohort is gonna be reported almost two weeks after the install. So, yeah. so editors will have to adapt for that. So uh, with all of that, I guess what I'm saying is it seems like it's gonna take some time. Um, what will probably accelerate that is I'm sure that um, We've even seen in some earning call, right, where like I think Snap was talking about how a lot of people are talking about how Scan4 will give their uh, company some advantage to provide better optimization. So I think the incentive of all the networks is to roll out Scan4 because of what it will do to our performance. That's a really good point, actually, because if you look at Google's recent earnings, YouTube, not so great, right? Search, however did very, very well. Search is kind of immune to ATT, app tracking transparency, right? And so that might be a hint that if Snap, if Facebook, if Twitter, if others get on the scan for train, figure it out really, really well, get good data, they can optimize better, they can monetize better. So they might have a huge incentive to get on this train real quick. Yep, yep. And I, I think that's what you know Apple has in mind as well. It's the motivation for everybody is because the framework got better, not worse. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, cool. So we've talked about a whack load of stuff in terms of scan four. Uh, it's more complicated for marketers. There's lots to think about. There's more postbacks. There's more conversion models. There's more triggers, trigger points in your apps for either the multiple postbacks and or the times when you might want to lock it and send it early. Uh, there's also more time between the ad view an install and getting data. Um, this is pretty challenging. I, I want to see a little bit about what is Singular going to do to make it work and make it better, make it easier. Yeah, I mean, honestly, the, on, on our end, um, when you know, when when you think of pretty much since SK Network came out, but certainly now the level of complexity. We're going to show you some examples has has risen dramatically and. On the one hand, it's a headache that the product has to change so much. But on the other hand, it's really fun. It's it's there's a ton of value we can add to customers, and um, and the, the the data challenges are also more interesting. Like our engineers, you know, if in the past things were more deterministic, now you do a lot of AI and modeling, and you build really advanced systems to to recover missing data, to be more intelligent, to to build statistical models. So like the 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 work, I guess, technically has changed, which is pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, and this, this comment came up. So I guess you're going to kind of answer this one. <laughs> and maybe we have been a little bit as well. It's getting more challenging. Uh, by the way, I'll just put a little plug in here. We are going to take a good chunk of time at the end. If you have questions, if you have comments, if you have suggestions, if you got ideas, just put them in the comments and we will get them up and we'll talk about them. But uh, yeah, Singular is has some stuff in the product that is getting ready for Scan4. What's that look like? What's it going to do? Yeah, absolutely. There's there's a ton of stuff that's really good, you know, good and interesting. I guess the the first four is the first thing is so scan four gives us deeper granularity, right? That's the biggest promise. You get these four digit source IDs, hopefully, if you uh, balance it out intelligently, and you could use it to encode more information. For example, geo breakdown, like we see in this example, or it could be a creative breakdown, which is very exciting. Now. Finding the balance is going to be important. So our system, you know, will help you make sure you're not abusing this, where you're basically, you have so much permutations, you're not going to get enough, uh, um, uh, you know, through the privacy threshold or getting the right post back tier. That's the right term right now. 
But also, even from a reporting standpoint, you can now encode countries and creatives, but you are essentially encoding that into numbers. So you need to decode that, that number one means this image, or number 15 means the United States, right? So there needs to be some encoding done to build reporting. So that's sort of the first thing, which is good news, more granularity. The second thing is, and this is more of a, it's a plus and minus. Marketers now have more headache because you now have two types of conversion values, fine and coarse. And um, there's also three postbacks. And sometimes you only get one postback. Sometimes you get three. And sometimes you get only the coarse conversion value. Sometimes you get the fine conversion value. So as a marketer, as a company, you need to build a model that will make sense and will basically support all these different scenarios. So there needs to be some coherence between the values, right? Like certain fine conversion values need to map the coarse conversion values. And uh, and it, they're not even going to measure the same thing necessarily. Like maybe the fine conversion value will be revenue and the coarse conversion value will be buckets of revenue or it could be some events. So this is just some fictional example we show on the screen. Um, but there's a lot of complexity here that, you know, our product will support out of the box for you. Um, that's why, you know, some of the questions about, you know, can you replace MMP? Honestly, my honest answer, and I know I'm biased because obviously I'm CEO of an MMP, but this stuff is so complicated that you can, if you want to pour a ton of resources in your company and try and build it in house, you can, but it's just like, you're going to fall behind and you're going to lose competitive advantage. So I don't really see any of this replacing a need for a platform. Um, awesome. The next thing that you also have to deal with is now you have this. You still have missing data. You're getting more, yes. but you still have missing data. Exactly. You're getting more, but you're missing more at the same time, which is sort of annoying. It just doesn't get easier. <laughs> so Apple now sensors data, you know, sensors data even more frequently in different scenarios, right? So you can have, um, for example, well, the first one is, is you don't really get campaign names. You get numbers. So you got to fill that in. But sometimes you don't get conversion values because you didn't reach the right postback tier. And if you just look at the SK network data naively, you're going to have horrible CPA. Like you can't just look at the data without accounting for information that's going to be missing. And so our system actually fills some of that missing data so that your numbers would make sense or it would filter it so you, you would be able to calculate things like CPI. And then lastly, now with this conversion values and postbacks, there's going to be even more areas of missing data. That's actually a really good point that you had back here, which is the missing data and your and your your CPAs look insane, right? And this is what we've talked about multiple times in webinars. Uh, Shamant has talked about this as well from Rocket Chip AQ. Your CPA is five hundred dollars, and you go, you throw your hands up in the air, and what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> How, this is not working for me, right? So you yeah. need to model yeah. for that missing data to make it make sense. Exactly. Um... And then, you know, kind of to recap this, at the end of it, you know, there's a lot of promise. There's a lot of complexity for scan for. There's a lot of promise. Um, and you're going to get more data and we'll help you complete the missing data. There's going to be more weird scenarios. You're going to get this geo breakdown, creative breakdown. Like there's going to be a lot more advantages. Um, and the nice thing is you're now going to be able to build cohorts. Like we had cohorts before in scan three, but accuracy will go way up with scan four. Uh, and building courts, that, that you know, the, the challenge is none of this comes out of the box. So these are all things we build on top of scan with AI, with advanced modeling. The bare framework is just not good enough. That's one of the things we've learned. And you really need to build sophistication on top of it. Um, and I'm pretty excited at what, you know, scan four is going to offer. And I guess, you know, maybe the slide before, John, is just like to say, um, I really think you need to work with a partner. And again, I know I know I'm biased. I'm just gonna. I, I've seen things that you know made me really comfortable with that statement. Um, you know, we offer a really complete suite. It's really powerful. But essentially, um, the the thing that I'm noticing is companies could really suffer if they don't know how to operate SK Network. This is a real customer example that they just didn't know how to spend on iOS. Things didn't make sense. Their cost per activation was like $5,000. That doesn't make sense. And then we work with them. We implemented different models. We taught them how to filter the data. We added um, basically another way to look at the data with the with sort of the reconstructed um, uh, sensor data. And suddenly it's like, okay, marketing team knows how to run iOS campaigns and the budget increases. And 
I'm, I'm sure you know other companies have seen that V curve, uh, but I really think if you implement Scan Four well, it's going to be a competitive advantage. And if you fumble and you have you know your setup is really weak and you just use the basic API, you're going to be behind. It's just it's really difficult. Thank you. Okay, cool. We're going to move into a section of live Q&A now. And so I'll take that out and I'll go up and start looking. This was the first one. Yes, it's recorded. And yes, it'll be available lots of places, including the singular blog, uh, multiple places. I think we answered this one from Mashi. Can you explain when we get two digit or three digit or four digit source IDs? It's complex was essentially the short form of the answer, uh, but you got to get volume and you got to not have too many source IDs. So I think I think we've we've we figured that one out. I'm just going to say if you have a question that you don't see come up here, feel free to share it in the comments. We can see it. We're going to bring it up. I'll throw it to Gotti. Um, you know, hey, John, so I saw somebody I saw somebody asked. They said the video just skipped the section where I was explaining the four digits. Um, oh. I'm wondering if, I don't know if the streaming app had some issue or something. Do you want to go back to maybe that final slide? You Let know, me see if I can find quick? it. Yeah, this one. Okay. You want to go over that real quick again? Yeah, I'll try and do it super quickly. So basically the notion is every install you get, Apple keeps a record and counts how many installs happen. And then let's say an install comes from a particular ID. Like in this example, it's 5521. Then according to the documentation, we haven't seen a visual on this, but according to the documentation, they will break that ID into three digits, sorry, two digits, three digits, four digits. And it will check for each of these hierarchies, which one has the most installs in the, in the well, really they'll check which one has the highest post back tier. And so if you think about it, two, two digits will always have the same or higher post back tier than four digits because two digits, there's probably more installs in two digits than four digits. Four digits is, has more room for, for changes. So um, we just, this example, we just wanted to show why even if you're in post back tier number three, the system can still choose two digits source IDs. And then you're going to lose, like we just showed in the features, you're going to lose creative breakdown. You're going to lose geo breakdown depending on what you use uh, your digits for. So... That makes a ton of sense. Absolutely. And I'm getting some calls. Hey, show this again. I'm going to bring that up really quickly and also uh, mention that as this is being calculated for you, you're seeing transparently what the confidence in intervals are. So if you are getting model data, it's telling you here's where we're, we're confident that the result is in this range. Right. And we think it's this, but you're getting the actual uh, confidence intervals as well. Yeah, okay. That was an ask actually from customers say, don't give us a black box with like thumbs up or down or like obscure stuff. <laughs> I wanted to see the confidence intervals, which I think is very fair. I mean, the, the world is moving to these more advanced statistical models, and you don't just want to spit out numbers in front of people. You want to give them some understanding of what, you know, how confident are we? Um, there was a question, John, from somebody about Facebook stopping campaigns. Yes. So let me find that one. Here I'm we go. Pretty sure I'm Frank. Saw, uh, and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure I saw some news that they're going to stop doing that. Uh, do you, you are correct. There was some news. They, they, they originally, whenever you yeah. change scan, they had a long period to adjust to it and they recently sped it up. Um, so <laughs> now yeah. they might have to make it longer again. Exactly. I was just thinking it was just announced that they're not going to pause campaigns anymore. But now with, you know, the really long uh, windows and the timers, <laughs> uh, you know, because the reason they did that is if you change the conversion model, they wouldn't be able to tell results from the past conversion model, or the new conversion model. And, and I think Facebook worked around that. But if they could still do that in scan four, that would be pretty impressive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, cool. Let's bring up, I'm going to go right to the top and see what we've got here. Okay, this is an interesting question. We This is a tough one to answer, honestly. Uh, this is from Aditi. You know, after the scan for update, which platforms will be best for iOS? We're going to need some time. We're going to need some time to see what's going on in the marketplace. We're going to need some time. You will have noticed some differences between, let's say, 
Facebook and Google and maybe lift off iron sources, iron source app loving just when scan three came out, who adopted it quickest, who was pushing back hard against it and really was super last minute and bringing out their, their, their documentation. We're going to have to see how that goes, but I think Gotti, your comments that this is in company's best interest to bring it in and to get better optimization and therefore monetization. So it's in their best interest to do it quickly. Yeah. I think that the, the probably the biggest companies like Meta and, and Google, they have sort of this unfair advantage where, you know, they have, I don't know, thousands of data scientists working on the ads team because it's the moneymaker for the company. And so you usually see them adopting uh, more innovative scan capabilities faster than the rest. For example, you know, the MMPs could send a prediction based on SK or conversion values back into a Facebook to use for optimization. All those features, I mean, now a lot of it will have to be uh, changed for scan four and enhanced, but these are more advanced features or uh, so my, my guess is we'll see SANS uh, producing some innovation there quickly. Uh, but, you know, the other thing I, I think we have here is um, in the past few years, like pretty much all ad networks, especially the big ones, the public ones, they all realize how important SK network is. And, and over time, they really built that muscle so that even if Facebook might have 10x more data scientists than someone else, um, there's still a lot of awareness. And we've, see, we've seen partners, big and small, reach out to us talking about our plans for scan four, how can we work on a joint uh, roadmap? So uh, it's hard to tell, you know, who's going to win in that battle, but for the first six months, I'm sure there's going to be differences in features. There might be some <laughs> networks to just do it better than others. It's just, it's that, that's what it is. Absolutely. Okay. Frank's putting you on the spot here. Uh, when will MMPs be ready to configure scan four? Uh, Adjust hasn't released anything yet. Why does it need five months to build scan four support? Um, what, what's your answer here? Um, I guess I would say that um, we just explained how for N networks, for example, there's going to be a lot of work to even start supporting scan for. And up until, what was it, like this week, right? We didn't even know about half these features. We didn't really know about the tiers. We didn't know you can lock windows. We didn't know the timers, like the fact that you can have a timer come in two weeks after the install. This is so, no I excuse. Mean, Build the feature already. <laughs> yeah, so maybe it sounds like excuses, but I do think we got some really new, and it's funny, I'm not here to defend the just, <laughs> the just but about. still, I want to be fair. And the first thing is that uh, it seems like it will take some time for the industry to adjust to this stuff, not, not pun not intended. Uh, and, uh, and so, I don't know, should it take five months? No. And, you know, I, I did see that even with the previous version of scans, not all MMPs built the things at the same pace yep. and differences. Even to this date, not every MMP has all the same features as others. So I don't know if you feel like things are slow and you can look up at alternatives, I guess. Here's an interesting question from Shannon, and this is about re-engagement, uh, which has been a real issue since audiences went away, since Scan was introduced and IDFA became very, very scarce. We know that Google is working on this in Privacy Sandbox for Android with Fledge, right? But do you see Scan for unlocking any iOS re-engagement campaign potential given longer look-back windows and additional post-back slots? Yeah, it's a great question. Let, let's think about it for a second. Let's brainstorm because I'm not sure. So one of the biggest issues with pre-engagement was that you could, uh, you, you lost your targeting ability, right? Like the, the big, the difference between just plain user acquisition and re-engagement is that you know who you're targeting. It's your past users and you can measure that impact. And with the loss of IDFA for the most part, uh, how would you re-engage that audience? Now, what yeah. you could do is you, you could maybe extract a list of emails if well i'm not even sure if you could do that but let's say you got the consent because apple doesn't allow you i think to even if you get people's emails you're not supposed to take that and use it for targeting on facebook well that's exactly what spotify is in trouble with right now with audiobooks right absolutely and if spotify can't do something random publisher number two three four in bulgaria certainly can't do that right so yeah. i mean on the face of it and you know i'm the dumb one on the panel 
The answer is no, because <laughs> you don't have an identifier, right? And you've got yeah. a longer postback. Um, you got more postbacks in the longer window, but you can't connect postback one, two, and three. You don't know that they're from the same person, and you don't even know yeah. who that person is. You don't even know who that device is. So unless there's some magical solution that we haven't heard anything about, I'm guessing no. Yeah, that's why I wanted to be cautious because I'm I, I can't think of anything that scan four gives you that makes re-engagement better. Maybe scan um, five. Maybe scan <laughs> five. Twenty twenty three. Our hopes are pinned on twenty twenty three. Maybe I missed something. If if you guys if we if we miss something, please leave it in the comments if you have an idea of how it helps. That absolutely. Absolutely. Here's a question from Paul. Mm -hmm. For companies with a web and app funnel, comparing performance between campaigns continues to get more. This is not a question. This is a comment. <laughs> yeah, and, I... and yes, yes, it does. But there's a but here as well. Now there's finally a way to actually measure it in the SKAD network framework, at least. Correct? Yeah, but sort of. I mean, first of all, this is a true statement. And you can, even if you don't have web to app, even if you just do, um, if you only have an app funnel, then Android versus iOS is difficult, right? But now you're saying, okay, I have web users on iOS and app users on iOS, and that's complicated. Um, web has the advantage of UTM parameters, which I don't know if and ever they'll they'll go away, but um, uh, but uh, they still give you a lot of data. Uh, Android obviously still has GID, it has the player refer, and it seems like privacy sandbox will be good, um, but. What John was referring to is that in this version, they released SKA network support for web. What's disappointing is that it's only on Safari. Safari. <laughs> so I'm not sure how. I'm not sure how you would even account for that. I actually was also thinking. I wonder if Chrome can still somehow implement it. Even when, I don't know if there's like a private API or not. There might be. I need to look at it, but. Because it's it's like you put a special link on your page and then it activates the SKA network framework. But uh, the, the challenge is now, what do you do? Like you look at the user agent of the browser and based on that, you serve different ads and then you account for SKA network only counting for some of your users. So it's, it's honestly, there's no clean answer yet. Uh, I, I, was, sure. I was sure before this detail came out that they would make it for any web browser, including Chrome, that is just a formation of a link in a certain way. And that would make sense and everything. You would think from antitrust perspectives that they'd get something done there as well. But you know what? We'll see how we can figure that out. Okay, here's um, here's a, uh, an interesting question from Thomas. And he's saying, hey, you know, how does M an MMP like Singular add value on top of Scan4? I think you talked about that a little bit, but maybe not bad to hit it again. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess the the the, the TLDR is that the base framework is very raw, and you get some like literally you get like two API functions <laughs> that you work with, and building a usable solution on top of it is uh, very difficult. There's a lot of different situations in which the data is hidden or censored or even selecting what data to use and how to use that API requires building on top of that framework. And so I think that um, if you want to look at a takeaway list, you could check our blog. Yeah, just what you have on the screen. Honestly, that will probably be showing you exactly what the advantages of, you know, how Scan4 is going to work well with our product, et cetera. If you're generally interested in how does MMPs help in SK Network in general, then we probably have other articles or you can just reach out to our team and we could share that. Maybe we should share it as a follow-up to people that sign up. But um, but yeah, the TLDR is that it's a very raw API. If you want to make anything usable on top of it, you got to do a lot of fancy stuff and that fancy stuff requires tech. <laughs> and so you either build it or you buy it. That's pretty much it. Yep. I want to bring this up real quick from Yulia. Uh, I mentioned that uh, you said here that you mentioned YouTube's not good. I don't want to say that. I'm just saying that <laughs> in Google's financial results, which just came out, uh, they, lost, they lost revenue as compared to the previous quarter from YouTube. They didn't monetize YouTube as well. Um, and the presumption is, and others in the industry have made this as well, that because of the way YouTube functions, it's not search that's driving which ads get shown in most cases, because there is search on YouTube, obviously, as well. Um, it, 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 it doesn't know as much about intent 
and behavior of people when it's showing ads and they're not quite as effective. That's what I'm saying there. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm not saying YouTube is not a solution in any way, shape or form. I guess Here, the, the official singer response for that would be that Google is still one of the largest channels. And so I'm sure that like, I, we, I'm not aware of any like particular issue with uh, YouTube and SK Network. I think, you know, they, they have a smart sophistication, a smart sophisticated setup on SK Network actually. And, uh, um, and, you know, I would assume they'll be able to do some pretty advanced things uh, over there. And one thing she mentioned, which was right, is like the big publishers do have an advantage because if you go back to the, uh, that slide, we talked about how it counts installs. If it's all coming from the same source app, that number goes up yes. much quickly versus yes. long tail uh, ad networks that have thousands of publishers, then I think you kind of get penalized by SK Network. Right. Which, in a way, it's kind of unfair. I don't think Apple did that because they cared about the big companies. They, their argument is privacy. If you have a million people come from YouTube versus five people from this game and five people from that game and five people from that game, they prefer going with the million that's more crowd anonymity. So that yeah. is a true comment. It somehow, unfortunately, favors the rich. <laughs> so I don't get know. rich, get Probably richer. Not Absolutely. Not, not fair. Let's bring up Anne Marie here. I have a feeling you might work for a company out of Finland that has um, birds that are not happy, but I could be wrong on that one. How do you deal with ad networks using source identifiers differently? Or do you expect them, I think, to utilize source identifiers rather similarly? Good question. I mean, <laughs> we're going to figure this out in real time. Aren't you happy about that? <laughs> I think it's a great question. And I think even, even today, um, in Scan 3, there wasn't a standard for what people want to encode in their campaign ID. Um, it didn't have to be campaign. And we had to decode it somehow with the networks. Um, this is, again, one of the pleasures of implementing a scanner. You'll have to figure out, you know, like how will Facebook do that and how will others will do that? And sometimes they might not give us the mapping and over time they might open up the mapping. So, yeah, I mean, honestly, John, your answer is we'll figure it out live based on each channel and what they do. Here's a question or a comment from Joe. How opaque is the early lock in Windows on Scan4? forced from ad platforms oh i'm guessing what you're talking about is locking in a conversion value um you know how, if if they'll force that and and how will singular help clients follow best practices maybe talk around that a little bit um uh, Gotti, because clearly i mean if something really good happens in your app you want to know about it really quickly so you can optimize on that campaign somebody some users uh, that you acquired from a certain source they're awesome yeah. They're be defeating levels, they're beating bosses, they're buying stuff, they're whatever. You want to know about it quickly, you lock, you send it in. But do you think that ad networks will mandate that? So I, I would split my response into two. The first one is the positive side, which is this is a new feature we just saw released this week. So we'll probably build the best practices with our customers. We'll think about it together and see when you should lock the window. Like if you have a KPI you really care about, like let's say you're optimizing for something in the funnel and you want to know when someone signs up or does a first time deposit or whatever, then if that's the end of your funnel, there's no point in waiting and you can send it sooner. That's the positive side. <laughs> the negative side is that uh, you basically asked, how will you follow best practices based on ad platform preferences? And the, the thing about the conversion window, or the, sorry, the conversion value is that you don't know which ad network this is going to be sent to when your app is setting the conversion value. You have no clue, right? That's part of the anonymization that SK Network does. So if, let's say, some ad network forces you to send data sooner, that's going to impact all the networks. <laughs> and that's part of the challenge. That's why people were unhappy where you could lock windows because it will, again, enable some strong networks to force you to their will and force all the other networks to their will. So yeah. on the positive, I'm sure there's going to be cool use cases and we'll share best practices with our customers. On the negative, some networks might use it in their favor because their optimization engine just wants data faster and maybe it's better for them than for you. And 
Excellent. Excellent. Very cool. I just love this, uh, this profile pic here from Saudi. I mean, like so, so relaxed, leaning back. It's awesome. Another question from Eddie T. Thank you for the questions, by the way. Really do appreciate it. It's awesome that you're engaged and asking great questions. Apple search ads, uh, different little beast, different little animal using slightly different technology in some cases. Hey, the MMP is able to track the numbers. Does this mean we should consider ASA for iOS marketing? I think just about everybody is because I think it's a really hot job for it for lots of different reasons thoughts there Gotti. yeah i mean it's it's true that their their api is more powerful right now um I, part of me is surprised i thought they would switch to the same sk network stuff faster um they do have an advantage though that the, for them it's all first party data so like technically you know if you're facebook and someone clicks on a product and goes to the facebook store and buys that product if it's all within facebook they can do whatever they want with their data so Apple's playing by the rules on that side. On the other side, people say, well, it's not really fair because the App Store is not really first-party data. And, you know, it's like should be considered third-party to Apple, et cetera. So there's an entire debate there. The bottom line is that ASA works. And it works not just because of this. It's just it's the same reason Google works, right? Like we spend a lot of money on AdWords for our own company because when someone searches for MMP, we want them to see Singular, right? Where someone searches for SKN Network, we want them to find them, find us, sorry. But uh, but the key here is that there's already intent. So I think, you know, ASA just works because it's it's located in the right place. You're capturing, you're harvesting the demand and the intent. And uh, regardless of the privacy stuff, it's, it's you know, it's, it's working. It's a good channel. And, you know, Apple didn't invent this. Like Google did it with search. Same yep. thing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, given that Apple has now added uh, additional ad slots, we might see a slight decline in efficiency as well. Also because the ad slots they added are at the bottom of app listings, which frankly, I, I've almost never gotten right to the bottom of those app listings. There's a new one on the Today tab as well, I think. Good question here from Tarek. It seems that most of the heavy lifting to cope with Scan4 is done on the MMP and ad network side. Well, there's a lot there, yes, as, so, as, as well as the publishers a little bit. What This is a great question. What are the most important actions that need to be done on the advertiser side? You know, that's where the rubber hits the road. That's what you got to do. Everybody else can go do their work and get it done quickly. What do, advertise, what do, what do advertisers need to do? I think it's a wonderful question. Um, so if you think about it, yes, there's a lot of infrastructure to be built by the Ender Crooks and MMP, but eventually the advertiser is the partner to all of this. And they, my recommendation is make sure you understand what are the possibilities and then figure out how, you know, in partnership with your vendor or however you're implementing uh, SK Network, make sure that you um, figure out how these new features can help your business. Like maybe the fact that you have a, course conversion value and you can map it to a very particular funnel in your app uh, maybe that fits perfectly and you want to use that or maybe all you care about is revenue or ad revenue so uh, i think the advertiser must be a partner and you know it, it's we're here to serve the advertisers and the same as the ad networks and so you know and we see a lot of sophistications from our advertisers so i, I my advice would be uh, learn about it and see what your vendor can offer or so what the industry can offer and then uh, make sure you you put in you know you you share what's what's important for your app and what's important for your brand um, that you might benefit from from scan for so I guess that would be my recommendation and then you know to be more practical it's probably I'm thinking like out loud it's a conversion value it's maybe how your different channels split into source IDs so like if you if you can make your ad network split by geo or by creative you might want to be involved so there they surely there'll be things where the involvement from the advertiser will be pretty obvious and, and necessary awesome and i just put up a link as well that kelsey shared there there's a readiness list that you can check out and take a look at and that'll help you be ready and prepared as soon as your partners are as well i have a question here from troy where do you see f predictive analytics and data science fitting into this new framework obviously they're pretty key aren't they Gotti? yeah honestly all over the place so for example um you use prediction and certainly in scan three because you wanted to understand what is that user going to look like seven days later and ideally try and compress that information into the postback you you have to send within one day 
in, in scan three networks force people to send it pretty quickly. So that's an obvious use case for prediction. Um, in scan four, you, you're now going to get the signal, but as we saw, you might get it only uh, 14, 13 days later, right? Like seven days is the end of the first, the second observation window. Plus, let's say the worst case is six days of a timer. So again, you use predictions, but now the nice thing is that you're getting some sort of a signal to see how off you were, right? So maybe you'll get like a, a second post back that's saying, okay, the revenue is roughly in this range and you'll see if you predicted that correctly or not. So that's one area where predictions come in. Data science is also all over the place because how do you feel missing data or censored data or stuff like that? So, I mean, these things go hand in hand. And I also think that's why, you know, our engineers and product team, they like dealing with this stuff because it's more advanced. Um, it's just nicer stuff than what we did, I don't know, years ago. This way more advanced technology. So we are nearing the end of our time. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Gotti. You've rolled with the punches, answered questions live. I want to thank everybody for being part of it. This was fun. We'll do this regularly. We'll figure it out. We're figuring this stuff out live. This this data just became available just recently, right? So uh, lots to do here, lots to think about. Thanks for being part of it and talk to you guys soon.